Hello. against uh, Moses and Aaron. 
In fact, something came out I noticed in the Bible reading this last few weeks in Numbers, uh, in, uh, in verses 16, where uh, it says that he went to, that uh, Korah and the others went against Moses and Aaron. And later on, in the 26th chapter, it says that they went against Jehovah. So it amounted to the same thing. They went against Moses because he was appointed by Jehovah. They were going against Jehovah. Well, I agree with that wholeheartedly, and there's no no denying that. But we're now under a new a new covenant. We're not under the old covenant, and the old covenant did have a fleshly mediator who made it very clear who the priesthood was and all that sort of thing. So I mean, that was, there's no denying that it's, it's crystal clear in the scriptures. But now we're under a new covenant, and the mediator of the covenant is Jesus Christ, who's in the heavens. Galatians fourth chapter says that our Jerusalem now is Jerusalem above, and she's free. And I don't see scripturally. <clears throat> where there is authorization for us now to have a mediator other than Jesus Christ. We don't see a mediator other than Jesus Christ, but an organization of people is evident. The kingdom witness work that's being going, that's doing right now, and that whole inhabited earth, that's an impossibility under any, any uh, manipulation or efforts of men. Impossible. There are other people preaching the same thing. Well, they're not making it known. Well, they are making it known, just people aren't listening if they're in Jehovah's Witnesses organization, they don't, uh, they don't take note of what other people do. But there are missionary services all over the world who are preaching about Christ Jesus and his kingdom. And they're down in little villages in Africa and all over the world. So I can't, I can't say that they have six million and we have two million, or they have a million and we have two million. I don't know. Well, they're not organized. But there's a lot of them. Yeah, but they're individuals like, like you and Laverne. Uh, do you feel that you could fulfill that preaching work right here in this area? I myself? I think there's other people in this in the neighborhood who are doing that, in addition to Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. Well, we don't notice them. Uh, we see them on uh, television, for instance, they're preaching. On the radio, they're preaching. I've had people come to my own door this last month from the Baptist Church preaching. Uh, I've ran into people at the college what preaching. Are they, what are they preaching? Preaching Christ Jesus and his kingdom. I've, I've questioned people like that, clergymen and such. I've never, never got anybody to give me a clear explanation of why Jesus is their Savior. Got vague ideas. They don't. They don't have a scratch of an understanding of Jesus Christ and His serving as a ransom sacrifice. That Jehovah's organization does. That Jehovah's Witnesses do. Well, the people I've talked to to them, it's very basic. You know, uh, people that visit us, uh, they thoroughly understand that Christ's sacrifice is an atonement. Uh, fellow in my class at school, same thing. I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, nor he with me, but uh, he understands fully that. Christ Jesus died for our sins and served as an atonement. It's very basic. I'm sure there are a lot of individuals. I'm sure there are a lot of individuals. And I also feel I'm sure that a lot of those individuals will probably come into this organization eventually. It's possible. So, when, like when you read in the Bible there, there is an instance of Matthew 24, 14, that's pretty basic, book, which is good news, Matthew mm-hmm. 28. Do you feel now in the changed circumstances that applies to you individually? How, are you going to fulfill that? No, I have been fulfilling that. How? What do you do? Talk to people. I meet them at school. Uh, meet them in the neighborhood. Talk to my neighbors. Talk to a few people while I'm working. I've been talking a lot. I don't record it anymore, but uh, I do talk and I, and I share it. How do I accomplish witnessing? I do the same thing. Rick and I are feel so close to Jehovah at this point that we're we're happy to share this with others. And just the the past month, people that we've had over for dinner. It's just, um, it's really remarkable. Within those, uh, that framework that you feel like that uh, it's necessary for you to repudiate or to attack the One Star Society? Not necessarily. No, one was a, one couple was a neighbor and their children. We just, you know, happened to meet them and they were very nice. And, um, you know, in fact, um, it really, discussing the Watchtower Society isn't something I enjoy doing. It's almost depressing. Well, I, when I, both Rick and I were raised as Jehovah's Witnesses. And it was something that we grew up believing in with all of our hearts. And when we started doing some research a few months ago in an effort to really become spiritual, we just came across some things that were very, very discouraging. I think the point should be made that when we started this this investigation, we were at a very spiritual low ebb, and we realized that. And in our thinking at that time, we thought that spirituality and that getting ourselves back into a spiritual situation had to be done within the framework of Watchtower Society. And so that's that's what our thinking was. We were going to just get ourselves spiritual, start attending meetings. Uh, we went to the, uh, that program down there at uh, Woodland Hills, and 
And that was our attitude. We were going to get spiritual, and we thought that would be within the framework of the White Star Bible Track Society. And so that's how we started out. But And I sold my business and everything, so for the first time in a long time, I really had the time to sit down and to really investigate. And uh, that's when we started bumping into little problems. And, you know, when you grow up as a witness, you're, you're taught, you know, you don't, you don't question the organization because you're questioning God. And that was our attitude until things just didn't fit. And then we start deal, digging in and peeling off layer after layer. And the deeper we went, the more problems we had. And, uh, again, we were, we were trying to keep an open mind. He brought up the situation there with Terry Summers. They were in our home and they had been complaining for about 15 minutes or longer. I don't know, been long, quite a while about all the things they didn't like. You know, uh, they couldn't believe that everybody outside the organization is going to die and this sort of thing, you know. And I was just listening to them. And so here I got two elders at my table and their wives, uh, both men that had been in the organization for years. I'd known them personally since I was a youngster. And so they were doing all this complaining. I said, well, I, I got problems with a few things, too. Of course, my problems went a little bit deeper than theirs because I had done some quite a bit more investigation. And I said, maybe you can help me to, to kind of sort this thing out. Well, it didn't work out that way. It, instead of getting the two elders, the older men, to uh, to give me some scriptural uh, encouragement, all I got was Terry Summers sticking a finger at me and shaking it and denouncing me and, you know, running me down, you know, attacking me personally rather than trying to give me some clarification. So, uh, you know, I, I had an open mind. I would have been happy to have taken out the Bible and, and listened to their instructions. I mean, I had two elders there, but I got nothing but denunciation from Terry. And uh, her husband said almost nothing, and the other elder from uh, Chatsworth, he didn't say much either. So, I mean, you know, I, where, where do you turn to? I guess they were surprised. They didn't know how you felt. They well, they didn't know. That's true. He's the grandfather of my children, Bob Smith. I, you may remember him. He lived in Lombok for a while, went to the, to the ministry school with us here. This team hall two ministry schools ago. Yeah, well, he wasn't here long, but anyway, he's been around a while. Well, I've, I've heard uh, objections, people investigating and planning out things. So say I, all I've ever found out was individuals and, and dates and things like that that have been corrected, and, and, and that's what really counts. God's organization has to, if they had a wrong view of something, they have to change it. They don't start out perfect. It's like a child growing up. They grow in maturity, grow in stature, and they grow in the truth. The whole organization has done that. The Christian congregation did it in the first century. There was a lot of problems in the first Christian congregation. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, just in my in my investigation, one of the major things that came up was this, this thing about 1914, if you read the letter, you know, that's a major gripe of mine, based on the fact that it's a major doctrine of the Watchtower Society, uh, that just the May 1st and the May 15th Watchtowers just had special articles about it, where they carried on page after page after page about how they predicted 1914, and what a marked year it was going to be, and this and that and the other thing. They didn't predict anything that came true in 1914. Absolutely not a detail. Well, in the Gentile times, that that can't be proven either from Scripture. Well, maybe we ought to interject here and that uh, we're not here to dispute dates or to defend the Watchtower Society. That's not our purpose here. The only purpose that we have here is that uh, as professing members of an organization or the Jehovah's Witnesses, if you want to uh, be in accord with the organization, or if you don't want to be, if, if you're going to be, uh, let's say, expressing viewpoints, which you don't have to be. Nobody makes or forces anyone of Jehovah's Witness to be a Jehovah's Witness. Okay, well, let me respond to that. The easy way, the easy course, the most pleasant course for me and my wife would be to stay with the organization. I mean, every friend I've ever had for 27 years, all my family, are in this organization. That's where I wanted to be when I started this study, and that's where I'd like to stay now, but I don't get, you know, every time you say something like what I've just said about 1914, I get a comment like what you've made. You know, no one wants to touch this. Nobody wants to, to come out and, and prove that they're right. They just want to say, well, you're against the mother organization. Hands off and leave you alone. You see, we're not in a position to have to defend the organization. We believe the organization is true. But you are in a position, theoretically, to teach me or to straighten out my line of reasoning if it's wrong. Seven years, that should have been done. Unless no, you, you think so. Well, yeah. But you know what's really sad, Bob? In the past two years that I've known you and Brother Vassar, the only time I've seen any seen you two for more than five minutes is when it was something serious like this. Never. And I'm talking about the brothers, the elders in the north. Not one 
call to see how we're doing. I didn't make the meeting for about, what was it, about two months. And I never had a call to see how I was. And I feel that's really sad for those that are shepherding. Yeah. I mean, here you are investigating. We face that situation all the time. But there are, are so many things that we could be doing to help people. Exactly. And that's the one thing that should mark God's people is love. See, we're not depending we on. The best no. That we have it in line of, in, of argument, because you're telling us that, that you're not here to, uh, to defend, okay? And like Rick said, if, if, uh, if you're shepherding, then you should be helping. No one's been there to help us. In fact, the night that we spoke with Terry and, and Dick and, and Bob and Dorothy, it was really a, a call that, you know, can you help us see what we're, um, there was nothing that no one could even defend the 607 BC. Why did they have to defend the 607 BC? We're living our lives by it. Hundreds of tens of thousands of people in this organization have, have manipulated their lives, molded their lives because of these predictions that the Watchtower Society has made through the ages. I mean, it's affected people, their, their health, their, their education, uh, their careers they take or don't take. Uh, I know a poor lady down in Canoga Park. She got a big bunch of money. She gave all of it to the Watchtower Society except what she needed to live to 1975. Now she's 60-some years old, cleaning houses. I mean, that's a tragedy that was brought up on her by this organization that she trusts in so much. And it has happened tens, tens of thousands of times over. People have altered their lives based on their faith in, in what their organization says. An organization hasn't come through and then doesn't even apologize for what they've done. So now you're going to change your whole life on something you believe in. And apparently this decision is so important to you, which is, which is what you're saying to us at this point. Uh, do you feel like that you've been able to research the, not only the, the scriptures, the Bible that we have that we can read today, but all, you know, all the, the research that the society has done over the many years? Well, and certainly I can. Is more of a conclusion or a better conclusion than they have? Yes. I remember. Uh, quite a bit of, in the truth. Let me qualify that. Obviously, I can't do in eight months what they've been able to do in a hundred years. You know, I'm not, I'm not that crazy. Precisely. But what I have done, I am sure of that it's the facts. I haven't gone beyond what's written at all. That was the very foundation. When I started this study, I want a proof of every iota of information that I got. And I feel that I have that. Now, I don't know everything and don't claim to. In fact, don't know that I ever will know everything. But the things I do know, I know are true. And I've found too many instances where the Watchtower has actually tried to cover up their misconceptions. And to me, that's deception. And, and that's the thing that really got to me. If, if, if you say something is wrong, that's okay. I can deal with that. And we all do. We're all guilty of that. But if you lie to me, maliciously cover up something, now I can't deal with that. And that's what I feel has happened with the Watchtower Society through the ages. They have, ages being 100 and some years, they've actually covered up, tried to hide the things that they've been doing. Was that 1975? 1975, 1914, 1874, 1873, 1799, 1925, 1918, so on and so forth. Well, I really lived through an experience since 1975. Well, me too, of course. Uh, I didn't, uh, I wasn't banking on on a good men, and I thought people that did were kind of fanatic. But the majority were. But I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, should, we sh I should correct you on something you said a while ago. That the Watch Society never apologized for 1975. They did. And I just stated for the Daniel Sipnik spoke an apology and said whatever the Western Society had said in regard to 1975, we apologize for any inconveniences it may have caused in the part of brothers. And they never did say that I'm again going to come in 1975. Well, I've got it all here in a notebook. Everything I've learned, I've, I've filed away, chapter by chapter. And I can walk you through 1975 from 1966 all the way through. And I guarantee you, they emphasize to the maximum now, Armageddon was going to come in 1975, and I remember as a kid of 16 years old sitting there in front of my congregation overseer, Brother Tanner, and hearing him tell me about 1975, and there was no doubt in his mind or mine or, or any other people in my congregation I knew that that battle was going to come in 1975. And, and now we hear everybody say, oh, I didn't say that, and not very many people believe that, but there was one article in the King's Service that got in there where they were commending those, commending those people who had sold their homes and, and sold all their belongings so they could pioneer to the end of the system. Now, I wonder how many of those people that they were commending back there in 1974 are now out of money and totally broke and okay. can't even pay to go to the doctor now. How many people were commended in the first century by Jesus Christ for putting aside and giving up uh, until the end of that system? That's fine, but it all came true. Did it? Sure it did. After Jesus Christ? When, 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 those when, people, 
Are you talking about Jerusalem? Great Tribulation no. didn't come. I'm talking about the first century CE. I thought you were talking about Jerusalem. Jesus' is, Jesus is followers. He commended many of them for giving up livelihood, giving up families, and, and, and for their faith and whatever, and the institution isn't here yet. But he didn't, he didn't tell them it's going to happen in 15 years from now, or it's going to happen on a given day, or anything like that. He didn't say anything to them that was not true. I'm sorry, he never said that either. Uh, I found about three references that could be taken that way in all the publications. Uh, the uh, book book was it was in 1974, and a whole chapter on again of the man's salvation. And was the Yosa? Never mentioned in 1975. That was in the golden opportunity to teach it. Oh, well, they were getting cold on it by then. Well, it wasn't a thing before that either. You want me to show you what there was? The publication. I've got it right here. I'll show it to you if you so desire. A lot of individuals have said a lot of things. I'm talking about this is from the why human creation will yet be set free. You'll see these are Xerox copies. I didn't type it out or anything like that. It's all Xerox from the actual publication. That's from the Awake. That's from the, well, that's from the book, and the other one's from the Awake. You can go through there, <clears throat> all the way through. They use adjectives like according to reliable Bible chronology, uh, things of that sort. I mean, they really emphasize it. Had talks to assemblies, I remember one, who will conquer the world in the 1970s. Uh, so the type was given this world-renowned earthquake talk, tying that in with 1975 all over the state of California, who knows where else. Yeah, he was thank you, sir. Yeah. 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 He was reprimanded by the society for what he said. He told me that. They really said in trade and said things way out of line. Well, everything I got there is from their publication. According to this trustworthy Bible chronology, 6,000 years from man's creation will end in 1975. The seventh period of a thousand years of human history will begin in the fall of 1975. And what did everybody assume that one last 1,000 would be? Well, I didn't know that. that one. This is yeah, it's funny now, and nobody assumes anything now, but back then they did. Back, back then, a lot of people thought the thousand year reign would begin in 75. That's right. Because it's taken like this. And that's a whole host of others in there, too. That's the 6,000 years of man's <laughs> creation is up. Well, I began studying back in 1952. Brother, he wasn't very well educated, but he has a book right there from 1943 where they say the same thing in 1975. He explained to me that it looks like the 1975 would have to be the limit, except that we don't know the two time difference between when Adam was created and the end of the sixth day. And he said if we knew that, we'd know when Armageddon was coming. Now they don't even talk about that because the time has passed so long. Yeah, they, they mentioned that. That's always been the, the fact. And I know some people get some a little overzealous and they think that it had to coincide, and it might have. It might have worked out that way. Mild, well, if I know the society has tried to say that, well, Adam was only there, you have to name the animals and this and that and that. You have to be pretty short. Well, maybe that is not correct in the day. Yeah. And they were unfortunate. This unfortunate that these statements were made. Maybe okay. maybe Adam lived 200 years. In the I mean, then you talk about Armageddon being in the 2000s. He may all be dead by then. Well, that's a very possible. Is that what we don't, we don't, I don't think the society has come out and said what you were saying there, but they did say this in 79, that they felt the coin was beyond the 6,000 years stuff. Since man was created. Yes. And yet they didn't know how long after that, after seven days. Well, so they preached, at first during that time, they were preaching about the difference between Eve's life, her birth, and they said that would mark the beginning of the thousand years, shortly after she was created. I think it was and then right. after that, you know, after a year or so of that, then they didn't even mention that anymore. They said they didn't know when he was created, but yet in the eighth book it says the 4,026. Well, that's what I had in mind. Uh, but even even so, and that may be correct, but still don't know how long after that the seventh day started. That's the great unknown. Or we don't know if there's any, any, any correlation whatsoever. Yeah. The sixth day could have gone on to uh, 3,875. We don't know. They, they never, never made the statement that that would end. Uh, the old system of things, Armageddon coming in 1975, nothing like that. No. But a lot of people, yeah, the one that's in the kingdom, sir. They used to say things like uh, one kingdom ministry, you know, it says 90 more months from 1975. I mean, they were down to counting the months all of a sudden. What kind of a message does that give you when they're telling you stuff like that? 90 more months till 1975 comes. I mean, they were, in, in, they were in, in instilling in us an enthusiasm for this day. I don't remember that specifically. But I remember talking a lot about it through the 60s, 65 and 6 on through that's 1975. And uh, I think most of us felt the same way as I do. That's a good possibility. It could happen, but not necessarily. And then why did they commend those people who, who went out and sold their houses? And it's sold it's commendable. Right? People are still doing it. It's not commendable to do it knowing that you're only going to 
have enough money to last 10 years. That's, that's not commendable. It's stupid. stupid. It's that, yeah. I, I but right. they commended them. Look at poor Brother Whitaker, which you, you folks know. The poor man sold everything, but was going to live to 1975, and he used to work for me. The poor guy was old and, and killing himself just to make a living. He didn't have to do that. But he, he trusted this organization, yeah, and on the he, basis of his trust, he did that. that. That's right, but he did I it on the basis of that organization. Well, what's really sad is that later, after 75, I think it was 76, they came out with an article that said how foolish those brothers to have read into this. When page after page, the several years that they they pointed to 75, well, if you look over this. Do you have that quotation where it says that these brothers are foolish? Yes, we do. Yeah. You want to read that one? Yeah. Quite a bit of research you do all this on your own. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've spent entire days doing nothing, eight hours, ten hours of doing nothing, but digging these things together. Had my whole living room table with the leaf put in it and everything, I mean the dining room table, filled with books from one end to the other, and it stayed that way for days sometimes. I have researched uh, glue in the face, and uh, and I keep coming up with stuff like this that doesn't 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 mm -hmm. correlate with reality. Six thousand years in history will come to an end, 1975, and he said that that means Armageddon. I said no, that's not what it says. He said well, yeah, you should have faith that that's that's what you should read between the lines. This expression he used. Let me give you an example of you know you want to deny that people thought this or the majority. I remember sitting in an elders meeting with Keen Morganson, and he was talking about 1975. And he said to the body of elders there in Lompoc, he says, uh, what do you say to the brothers when they say that? Uh, the world was going to come to the end in 1975. Well, they always raise their hands real quick, and they say, well, they never said that. Gene Morgan says, brother, they did say it, and he took out a notebook just like that, and he proceeded to show us where they did say it. And I assume these brothers sat for the same meeting shortly thereafter. I mean, he realized, the man who had gone around all these various congregations, dozens of them, he realized from his experience that there were a lot of brothers disappointed by this sort of miscalculation. It was indication it could be taken that way. Definitely, a lot of brothers did. Uh, I'm sure that the vast majority didn't. We talked a lot about it. Well, I can't argue that. You know, yeah. your opinion, I have to respect that. Well, uh, I think we can respect your opinion, too, from that standpoint. Uh, Rick, and, well, you know, again, we're not here to badger you about what you believe at this point in time or whether, you know, or force you to try to believe what we believe. Because, you know, it appears to me, from what your conclusions are, you feel like if you come to uh, a conclusion that uh, the what the Bible back with me basically is not teaching the truth, you understand it differently. Yeah, I agree. Correct. Uh, that's that's correct. Saying. That's what I'm saying. Are you saying that you just don't want to be part of the organization anymore? That's right. right. Unless I can find some excuse that I can come up with or some rationale that I can come up with to, to live with this knowledge that I have. If I could in some way rationalize knowing what I know and still being a part of it, I mean, I'd be, I'd be uh, elated to be able to do that. Because, like I said, I mean, I've got everything to, from a from a human standpoint, I've got everything to lose and nothing to gain from purely human standpoint. From the standpoint of my relationship with my God, of course, I have to follow my conscience. And so, I mean, there's there's nothing in it for me from a purely human standpoint to try to uh, come up against the Watch Our Bible Tract Society. There's there's nothing in it for me from that standpoint. Well, we can say that is that not only we we haven't had the eight months. You have to okay, and we we at this point in time, and I speak for myself, but. You know, I feel society does have a truth, and you know, uh, I feel like the society has proven it adequately, and uh, I know they've made mistakes, they've corrected them, and nobody is perfect. The mistake they've made, I feel they've corrected, and I don't feel it would you know, be appropriate at this point in time for me to debate that with you, because I, I am as firm in my convictions as apparently you are in your convictions. Well, I, I can respect your decision in that matter, and the only thing that I would say in that particular respect is, and then I think we should accede to your wishes and desires. Whatever, I I don't want to say I, that I wish I could uh, make the whole thing, you know, be able to live with it. But, I mean, they do claim to be a prophet and uh, be God's sole channel of communication to mankind. And I just can't believe that God deals that way. Look back on God's dealings with men. It's always been that way. Yeah. Now, you you can point to a time when you told them one thing that was a lie, and then they had to come around and change their viewpoint, and then sometimes they change their viewpoint again. I've seen the watch start cycle from this to this and then back to the original, back and forth again. Yeah. There's some, uh, I pick out individuals here, and about the three that I found, and maybe uh, Father Oak was one of them, who were, it, uh, I thought it was unfortunate, it wasn't said right, like when they said that, that a person would have been an uh, understandable age, age of understanding, in 1914. Well, that was purely speculation. It wasn't a scriptural statement that would have come from the Bible. It was just a matter of, did 
production, they figured that's probably the way it would be. Only they stated like that was that was the way uh, that it would probably be, or how they worded it, but it would mean a person of understandable age in 1914. Well, they said in the 60s, they said it would be 15 years of age, 10 days on 12. And then it went to 10, and in the latest watchtower it said zero. Those were born in 1914. Well, why do they keep putting it in? We got three of them there in a row. And it's very unfortunate, and I'm sure they do too. But they're still doing it right up until May of this year. Uh, but it's it's a matter of human. The organization in South Africa they used to wear a cross on their lapel. Yeah, but so Tom, you just told us you feel that this is Jehovah's organization, and he's using them to give out this information. Then why why the contradiction? I didn't uh, dispute that Jehovah wasn't using the organization when uh, Moses made the mistake that he did. He he made was, a mistake. The big difference, though, is he was dealing with a human mediator. Now he's dealing with. Jesus Christ is a mediator, and he's dealing with his Holy Spirit as an instrument for, for teaching people according to the scriptures. But also, uh, Moses had the Holy Spirit, didn't he? But that was Jehovah's arrangement. That was the old covenant. Clearly, that was scripturally. I can't argue that. That was the arrangement. We are now under the new covenant with a new meaning. We were talking also in practical usage. Did Moses make a mistake? Sure, he did. Was no doubt about it. Were they corrected? Well, did that mean then that Moses really didn't represent the true God? No, he did. Absolutely. And, and he had that he had that authority as mediator and that was to be expected. Did Peter have the Holy Spirit? He had the Holy Spirit, yeah. Did he make a mistake? He had a mistake, made a mistake. He was corrected. But one thing you find throughout the Bible himself up as God's organization. That's the difference. He didn't set himself up in that position. They were pointing to Christ Jesus as the mediator. He was the one that they were already pointing to Jesus Christ. They were pointing to a faithless slave. They were pointing to a governing body. They were pointing to an organization. You can't find that in the scriptures. In the governing body of Jerusalem and, and the uh, city, early uh, uh, Christian congregation, did they have to make reversal from some of the decisions they arrived at? No, no. I've looked that over thoroughly. I'm not under the understanding of the Watchtower Society is preaching. They would have us believe that it was a governing body with special uh, authority, and I don't see it in scripture at all. Could the governing body be not? It's not in scripture, no. You realize it was 17 years, Paul preached for 17 years before he even bothered to meet with the governing body. And he was in Jerusalem three and a half years after he started his preaching, and all he looked up was Peter. Now that doesn't make any sense. If this, if this governing body is here in Oregon, is in, in Jerusalem, and this man here has been personally commissioned by Jesus Christ to go out and preach, and here he is in Jerusalem, they don't look him up, and he doesn't look them up, that doesn't even make sense. Is that God's organization? No, he's dealing with well, that's what the Watchtower Society preached. They say it was a governing body. I say it wasn't. Well, they were just governing body from what it did. It doesn't loosely, extremely well, loosely. That's yeah. presently terminology for something that occurred. To them. I mean, they didn't. I don't think they called it the governing body. I don't see anything that said that. Yeah, I don't that. see anything in scripture. I've, maybe I've missed something. But I don't see anything. anything. Obviously, there was a group of older men that, sure. that, that they met together and discussed and rendered decisions based upon uh, the brothers would bring things to them, and they would render those decisions. At least they on one occasion. Fact, they, in effect, as a body of older men, okay, had a governing effect, did they not? They did in that one in one occasion. They did have a governing effect. But to say that they were as they were the instrument, the commissioned instrument, there's no evidence in the scriptures that they were commissioned by Jesus Christ. He didn't leave any principles for apostolic succession, the establishment of a governing body. It's just that those were the apostles that were left. They were in Jerusalem. They were old men by then, and they had the problem come up with circumcision. Well, who who would be a better group of men to get together with? That old man. It makes sense. And he's certainly not going to ask all those old men to go out across the country. So they met there in uh, in Jerusalem. But even the, the expressions of Paul in Galatians, the second chapter, it's always like a whole hum attitude about the governing body, as Watchtower would call it. Really, uh, he wasn't depressed. The yeah, organization had a very, very loose, as you said at the beginning, as an organization. The faithful and sweet slave is probably the best description of the, of the group that governed. Of course, they didn't use that either. They didn't use that phrase. We recognize now that that was a prophecy. And uh, began to be fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, 33. That's what it evidence is to us. That's when it began to function as such. Then how come we can't trace it? Well, it's all through the Greek scriptures. It's traced. You can't trace it from, from the first century all the way up to the 19th and 20th oh, no, century. We can't. we can't. But it started then, and hypocrisy set in, and that's where the organization was cut off as an organization, a Christian organization. See, they weren't even organized for the most part. Right. I think they, the, the Jewish Christians, they believed in, in the Sabbath. They all they went to the temple, they, the circumcision, all the festivals, everything. They looked more like Jews. Even the resurrection. And then you had the, the Gentile Christians, on the other hand, uh, they didn't believe any of that stuff until they started being influenced, and then Paul steps in and tries to stop them. The only thing that they were united in was their was their feelings towards Jesus Christ and the rest. And that was it. They didn't even look alike. Uh, they looked like totally different camps of people, yeah. except for their unity in Christ Jesus. Yeah. yeah, and that brought them together pretty good, but it took a long time. But they weren't required. They weren't required to 
they have an organization dictating you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this, well, you got to do this. Yes, they didn't do that. Yes. When yes. did it come yes. to that? Book of Revelation, where it talks about the second and third chapters. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the different congregations' reactions to this one, the uh, idolatry and the fornication that went on in some congregations, and then the commending of other congregations who were doing well. But see, that, that, that's not parallel to what I'm talking about. This, yeah. That was both describing the situation <clears> then, and there was a prophecy that turmoil was going to move right. on. But what I'm saying is, they weren't. The Jews were worshiping in a distinct way. The Gentiles were worshiping in a distinct way. Now they both realized that immorality was wrong. Yeah. I mean, there was no question about those things. But they got together. That was Paul's effort was to get them together, and that's why he said they all had to think the same thing and be in agreement. And they weren't. They were. Just the only thing they were in agreement with was, was their feelings about the gospel message, Christ dying, being resurrected, paying the price for their sins. I mean, that's what they were. They got together in an organization. That's when the circumcision issue came up, and that's when it really showed that they were making a decision, and the word was spread that they had made that decision. And it was a few years after that before everybody got along with it. But we've seen the same kind of thing in this modern history in the last hundred years. We've seen the same kind of a thing, a small beginning of getting back to the truth, the restoration. And it has to be done in an organized way, especially when you've got over 200 countries to deal with and so how many languages. It has to be organized. And so it wasn't back there, and they sort of functioned uh at least they functioned under God's spirit. The only way it could be organized, the only way 200 different lands of people can get together. If they didn't have 200 lands, they didn't have... No, but they didn't have... Well, where was all that we had? At this point in our discussion, we're running out of tape. So Laverne gets up, excuses herself to go to the restroom, and while she's in there, she's turning the tape over. But the discussion did continue without her, and we have no record of that on the tape. The individuals there discontinued their discussion of the necessity of an organization, and we began to discuss the preoccupation that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society has with this date of 1914. This date hinges upon a date that they claim Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. They claim that it was in the year 607 B.C. There is no evidence whatsoever that that is true. In fact, the overwhelming evidence is that in the year 587, the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. And so it's along those lines that I am discussing this with these gentlemen. Of course, they don't uh, accept the historical view. I knew that, of course. And so what I'm doing is turning them to the scriptures, to Zechariah the first chapter and Zechariah the seventh chapter. And these chapters of Zechariah indicate clearly that it would, in fact, be 587, the very date that secular historians claim is when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. So when the tape continues now, that is where the line of reasoning will begin. Well, it's Zephaniah, the first <coughs> Zechariah. So it doesn't give a date there to work here. Yes, it does. The date that it gives is the eighth month of the second year of Zechariah. Now, we're talking just a few years from, from uh, 537. Actually, we're talking now February 519, and the, the aid book, or the your your kingdom code book also verify that this is 519 when this was written, the second year of Darius. And it says there, verse 12, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these 70 years? But you subtract 70 from 519, and you're going to come up with the year 589. That was the very year that history says that Nebuchadnezzar came up against Jerusalem. He besieged the city for a year and a half. 587, they broke through the walls. And then over in the 7th chapter, it does the very same thing again, except from a different standpoint. Now it says the 4th year of King Darius. So we just add two more years. Now we're talking 517. Yeah, they have. But what they say is the 70 years applies to the 70 years of death desolation. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says these 70 years. I don't want to say that. No, it doesn't leave it open at all. It says the same thing here. Again, uh, uh, then the uh, word of the Lord Almighty came to me, ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? Well, the fast in the fifth month was the destruction of Jerusalem, and the fast in the seventh month was the, the assassination of the governor. Well, you subtract 70 years from 517, and you're going to come to 587 again. That's crystal clear. A person would have to do our research on that themselves to get it clear. Well, it's a, lot, it's a lot more clear than, for instance, I'll give you an example, where the Watchtower Society says in Daniel, the first and second chapters, Daniel says in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, speaks of himself being in Babylon. So what did they come up with? In that your kingdom come book, they say Daniel didn't mean the second year.
year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. He meant the second year after the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, you know, that's kind of absurd that an intelligent man like, Nebuch- like, like Daniel would say something clearly, and then we were supposed to guess that he meant 20 years later, actually 18. So quite the reason they do that is because it doesn't fit in to their chronology, so they have to change those, those details to make it fit. How does a tree dream fit in with that? I don't think it fits at all. And if it did fit, if you did use 2,520 years, you'd still be off 20 years. What society does, what uh, we do, sometimes is fit things together uh, as they fit. Something that's left open, not thoroughly described, if it fits with something else, then it must be like pieces of a puzzle. If they just fit, well, you got to put them together. Well, that's, I agree. That's, that's what they've done. But they, they've gone beyond what was written in doing so. They've taken uh, things that didn't apply, and, and they've... Uh, and they've manipulated them. The truth of the matter is they didn't even come up with 1914. It was being preached a lot earlier than Russell. He just picked it up from the Adventists and the Millerites and started preaching himself. But uh, they just concocted these things going beyond what was written. Well, individuals can do that. In some cases, that's what was done. And it appears to me they've been preaching it for over 100 years now. 14 was a... I would never find anything... Everything fits to that. That's the turning point. Well, well I agree. It was a momentous year. I mean, I thought... I'm not going to deny that. I'm also not going to deny, deny that we're in the last days of the system. But I see nothing scripturally that, that we can point to to say that, that at this given point, something happened in heaven, or something happened on earth, or whatever, because the scriptures just don't support it. And then we have hinged all of the, the dates and the chronology and the speculation have all been hinged on that date for a hundred years. All that tells together. Everything supports everything else. Revelation. But it does. Well, well, we're all together. I don't see that it does. At least from that particular standpoint, the, the dates don't even fit. They can't even prove the dates. What will survive for the last days? What do you feel is going to survive? What will survive? On a part of Christian individuals. How, how about doctrinal matters like Trinity, Hellfire, Soul? Well, I don't know. And I'm not to say. Uh, I mean, I can't judge people on that. I do feel, after having so many things that I believe to be true crumble before me, I would not stand up and say, that this man's right and this man's wrong and I'm right or I'm wrong. I can't say that. Um, I think that's yeah, totally out of line. Um, in fact, First Corinthians 8, I thought was a real good scripture. It says, the man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. And I think that's the key, is to be known by God. It's got to be an individual basis. There's no doubt about that. It's got to be an individual basis. That's, that's what I believe, that it is an individual one-on-one relationship between Jehovah, Jesus Christ, and man. If all we could think of about God using an organization, though, it comes together to that. Even the, even the carrying out of the preaching of the good news, that, that's just a, such an overwhelming evidence. You know, I, I, you know, I've heard that, and I believe it myself to be true. Last Sunday, when I was at work, uh, I went to this, this beauty salon we were cleaning up, and I turned on the radio, and it was a religious program, and I was listening to it. And they, a part of this program was a news, a news program, just like you were turning on the 6 o'clock news. And they were making different reports on all the various missionary, missionary groups throughout the world. I mean, there are people doing missionary work all over the world. Now, they're not known as Jehovah's Witnesses, and they may not even be in conjunction with this group or that group or another group, but they're all preaching Jesus Christ and his ransom sacrifice, which was the same message that they preached back there in the first century. And they are doing it on a worldwide basis. Probably more people than the Watchtower Society, not that it proves anything, but there is, in fact, a very large amount of people dedicating their lives to the preaching this world, world around. And uh, but what I've noticed about most of that, if not maybe nearly all of it, not all of it, but nearly all, is that they carry along the nationality and the politics along with it, wherever they come from. That's still their, that's still their allegiance. Wherever they go to preach Jesus Christ, they're still American and Australian or whatever they were before. And if their country needs them, well, that's, that's where they go. Well, they're they're not, not, I can't deny it. In other words, they're part of the world. There are, are those who, who fit into that group, but there's also those who don't. I'm oh, sure, oh, sure there are. And like I said before, I can't help but think that uh, most of those are going to come into the, this organization, come into the truth, because of their, their heartfelt desire to serve God and do it in the right way. Maybe uh, maybe the other selfish motives that some have, but they'll never reach that. But we can't judge that. But the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses that are, are fulfilling, not, not that they set out to say we're going to preach in 200 and some lands before Armageddon comes, but they did take the commission to preach the good news worldwide, and they surprised themselves as to how far it's gone. It well, I would, I would put more credence in it if I could agree with the message they were preaching. 
guess that's where it comes down to. I know the preaching kingdom established in 1914. I see no basis for that whatsoever from Scripture. And instead of them coming to grips with that doctrine, all they do is keep changing the, the generations on it so they can buy more time. I mean, just since I've been a teenager, they've bought themselves 15 more years. When I was a teenager, it was, it was 15 years of age. Yeah. And now it's a, down to zero. I think that wind card that you would suppose 15 years was a age. And, uh, and then a little bit later on, they, they, uh, said that that would be a supposition. It was, it was a, uh, speculation that maybe that's the way. But why should an organization that claims to be the, the channel, those that feed, Probably. Meet in due season. Why should Probably they have to apologize? Individuals that but don't they claim the watchtower that these are Jehovah's words? No, they, they never claim infallibility nor inspiration. But they, they do keep claim committing mistakes. As a matter of fact, they do claim they're God's only channel. They also claim that they're God's prophet in modern times. See, we're playing with words. Why don't when you when you when you nail them down to something, they say that uh, we're not inspired. But then they tell you that they're a prophet. Well, a prophet comes in different sense too. We're prophets if we read from the Bible. We're prophesying, we're Bible prophecy. <coughs> but it's not our origin. We're not originating that prophecy. And neither is society originating prophecies or teaching what God has written down as a prophecy. Well, it's where they violated 1 Corinthians 4 6 and going beyond what it's written, I think you get in trouble. You got over 100 years of record of doing that over and over and over and over again. And it's like they go off half cocked. They'll, they'll, like the thing with disfellowshipping at one time, you uh, weren't to talk to anyone who was disfellowshipped. Then they turn around and change that you could. They turn around and change as you could. They did the same thing with Acts 2020. They went from one to the other, then back again. They did the same thing with whether or not we're, we're actually uh, ministers. He's He's a whole, you know, some organizational viewpoint that has been changed over the material. Okay, that, that's not, not what it means. Point. Not when it means people's yeah. lives. What is important is whether or not you believe in the ransom sacrifice of Christ Jesus. I don't think the society has ever changed that even. Whether or not we uh, this fellowship and then you can't talk you can't come to the meeting, you have to sit in the back, you have to come in early, you have to come in late. The superior authorities, whether or not that's changed back and forth, speak God, then it's the government, then it's the Christ Jesus of God again. That's that's really not what's really important is to accept Christ Jesus. Well, that's what I've been saying all along, that that's the important thing. But and then, uh, now you, you say these 70 years here, when we talk about time periods, how do you know that, where does it say here in Zechariah that 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 those 70 years must begin counting from the eight months in the second. How do you know that that, when he's writing that, he just refers to, like, I could be talking today and say, oh, yeah, those hundred years, and I could refer to a time period that six years ago or ten years ago or twenty years ago, and still call it these 70 years. Well, how do you, we're talking about an that? angel, first of all, under inspiration. And he said these 70 years. He didn't say those. He said these. 70 years. Now, if I told you these 70 years or these last five years, you're not going to assume I'm talking about the 18th century. I mean, why, why do we have to add something? I mean, you could be off five or six years and still say these last few years. Well, he didn't. And then I could say, well, I don't think he means 84 and 83 in that period. He means 77 to 82 by saying these last five years. What, where do you find that? That it's got to be in right where you say. Well, it's interesting. Where does it say that? It, it's interesting that it does correlate with literally thousands of manuscripts That's that prove that it's 587. Thousands of manuscripts, have you seen them? What are they? Well, there's 2,500, for instance, of the the records of the sons of Agabi, which were the, which were the banking people for Nebuchadnezzar, for the royalty. There's 2,500 of their records just go from day to day to day to day in the British Museum. There were over 4,000 of these records from that one company, a banking company. Every time Nebuchadnezzar bought a chariot, they had a record of right down to the day. They've got thousands of records from the astronomers. They've got records of the royal inscriptions in the bottom of the stone. They all say 587. They all point to 587. Not a one of them disagrees with another. I went to seven different distinct archaeological, historical, banking records, and the chronology of the Egyptians, and they all dovetail together 587. And then you take the, the Bible and put it together, and it also says 587. And it, yet you don't answer me why. You know, I, I don't see right here. So I believe that it says what it says. Right. I don't think I should have to, to make excuses for it. I don't think I should have to add to it or subtract from it. I just take it for what it says. It says these 70 years, not those. Those would be back that way or over that way. These is right now present. I mean, that is the way we use the word. We're continuing to, to talk or want to talk at all find some something we could say to make you change your mind, to see things the way you 
have seen them before, and uh, we're not going to do it with this. I find it, uh, and, and really where our interest is in you. That's the reason we're talking now. If it wasn't, we'd have quit a long time ago and gone on with something else. But I find it hard to see you're very definite about these dates, and that concerns you greatly about the dates that the society has been wrong on. Well, the they're very definite about it. Well, no, they haven't been there as definite as 1914, yes. No, that's all I'm talking about, 1914. Uh, the doctrinal matters, I asked you about that, and, and you weren't so sure about that yet. Okay. Uh, those, definitely the Bible. The doctrinal matter. They think that the kingdom was set up in 1914. I disagree with that. I think it was set up at Pentecost. In accordance with what the Bible says, again, at Mark, the ninth chapter. Well, I know what that reference is, too. I know what we understand it to mean. And he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death's death before they see the kingdom of God come in power. You know, what happened after that, that they saw a vision of death. Well, he didn't say a vision. So you're adding that in. No, that happened. That's in the account. Oh, I know they saw a vision, but well, that doesn't that say this will apply. That doesn't say that this will apply. No, but that, that did happen, and that, that would fulfill it. No, it doesn't say so. That was a vision. He's talking about the kingdom. He didn't say a vision. He said you will see the kingdom. The vision, a vision of anything is not the reality. No, but you can, you can see a vision. That's what John saw. He saw these things happening, but it was a vision that he saw in Revelation. But, other but he wasn't matters, seeing the reality. Other doctrinal matters, like Trinity and, and uh, soul, uh, hell, those things, uh, if I got it right, you're not sure of. And yet, uh, and yet I know that you can go right to the Bible and prove exactly what those things are. At this point in time, I'm pretty much in agreement with that. My studies have not taken me into those areas as yet, so I'm not going to take a, a concrete stance that, yes, there's a Trinity, no, there's not a Trinity. Uh, in, re in regards to that, I do believe that uh, the Watchtower Society is not giving Jesus Christ the credit that he deserves and the emphasis on him that, that they should. I do think they, they have not fulfilled the responsibility with regards to Jesus Christ and his position. Is there all independent studies, or Just you, you and Laverne? All these doctrinal things, yeah. You know, you say your studies, uh, you know, studying with somebody, you know, mm -hmm. or studying at home. Or somebody's course in the <laughs> or studying at home. Yeah, I need to really study into these other things. Uh, my, my impression is that you've gotten uh, so deeply involved in uh, faith and prophecies. Well, you know, the involved. truth book um, that came out in 68 or 69, the chapter on examining one's religion, it, it very much encouraged one to go into examine their religion, and they should not have any fear of finding anything. Uh, in fact, it was mentioned later that if, if there was even one falsehood found in the religion, how could that, how could their faith be found on truth? And I guess this is where we've come. Especially, the one thing that really bothered me was the, the Malawi situation, the brothers that gave up their life for something that, um, that was really uh, null and void. Political compromise? Well, it was the same thing that. Well, for, it wasn't a political card as we as we think it is. Malawi is not a. It's, there is no party in Malawi. The brothers in Mexico have been doing that same thing for years, and society knew this and excused it. And yet, our brothers in Malawi died. Their wives and, and children were raped. This distresses me because it's not only hiding facts, but it's 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 really a sad thing. Point that you're trying to make that we we found out that this we didn't find out on our own <clears throat> was that the society was allowing these people down there by the hundreds to die in one camp alone, one camp where 320 children died of starvation and could have just for people that they would spend 25 cents to buy a card saying they belonged to this party. There was only one party. I mean, if you were living in Malawi, you were a part of that government, like it or not, you were a part of the government. Buying a card that said you were a part of the government didn't change a thing. You were still part of the government. But while the society is allowing these people to die by the hundreds, this came to the notice of the, of the Mexican brothers at the branch in Mexico. They were disturbed about what was happening there in light of what was happening in their own country then and to this very day. The Mexican men, the males, when they come to be of the age of 18, are required to join what's called the marching army in Mexico. And if they do not have this card, which is called a cartilla, they are not allowed to get a passport, for instance, in some jobs they can't get, government jobs. Well, what they do in Mexico, the majority do, is that they go to an official and they bribe the official for the card. The card stating that they are in the militia, in the military. And then, at various intervals, they're supposed to go and march. And again, they get the signature that states that they've done the marching. And some of these individuals have even held rank down there in Mexico 
Mexico, and they do so to this very day. And the branch wrote to the society about it. One time, they got back a letter, and the branch said, it's a matter of conscience if they choose to bribe the officials in this way in order to get into the, the military. The branch wrote back a second time to New York, and they wrote back a second time. It's not a matter that we choose to get involved with. It is a matter of conscience. Now, it's hard It's hard to believe. I got this from Ray France, and he, I heard that he had it, and I called him, and he sent me the actual document, and I have them in my possession. That's right. From the governing from the governing body to Mexico twice, the branch report originally, which was from him, Ray France, when he was on the governing body, and then the two letters from the from the branch in Mexico. I have all five documents. Who wrote the letter to Ray France? The one card You mean the one Ray France when he was in Mexico? He wrote a report to the governing body about what was going on. And then, and then the branch back to the society. And then the branch servant, or who was ever on that body in, in New Mexico, or Mexico City, excuse me. At that time, they were the branch the government. Well, that's right, he was. That's how he knew about it. So wh- how, why can, how can they do that? Another thing that it came to light about Mexico, we've been under the impression all these years that they are a cultural organization because the government does not allow religious organizations in there. That's not true. They can be a religious organization, but they cannot own property. And so because they want to own property in their kingdom halls and their branch, they will forego using Bible in their meetings, they will forego singing songs, and they will forego prayer at their meetings because they want to own property. All they got to do is lease their property from the government, and they can be a religious organizations just like the Catholics, just like the Protestants, just like anybody else in Mexico. Well, I haven't been there. Laverne lived there in Guadalajara. She has been to the meeting, and she can confirm that that's the way it is. Their meetings are not like our meetings, and here the brothers in this country were beat up, run down the street, shot at, killed, and everything because they wanted religious freedom. They wouldn't compromise. And over here, they, it's no big deal. They, they got to own their property, so they, they're compromising for expediency. Yeah, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of wrong information there. Uh, well, got to you the way it really is. I've, I've got, like I said, copies of the actual letters, and they make it very clear that that's, that's what the situation is. I, do, I, I qualify. I do not have the letters about the owning the property. But I don't have that. But I do have the letters from the governing body to the branch stating that it's all right to bribe officials to be in the military if it doesn't violate your personal conscience. That's absurd. More to that, because brothers being appointed and responsibility in the congregation to do it. Uh, I'll pay I don't recall. Well, I said there's a lot more to it than what you got. Well, I mean, how much clearer can it be? They said it was a personal conscience. Fact, matter of personal conscience to bribe officials. That's not clear in the Bible that you have that right. And also to join the military and to hold rank in the military. I mean, when I was a military age, they wouldn't even allow us to work in hospitals. We had to go to prison. If we were to take, if we were to, to work in a hospital instead of go to prison, then we would be disassociated. I mean, they demanded of us absolute to the letter. You weren't disassociated to work in the hospital. You just weren't responsible. You weren't appointed any responsibility in the congregation. Well, at the time that I was in the, in the, in the draft, you would be disassociated. Yeah. Well, I was there. I was there at a different time at 18, and that was the stand. They wouldn't allow for us. And so a lot of brothers went to prison and did it. Some did. There was a different way of looking at that. Brothers who worked in hospitals were considered immature and, and uh, not responsible. If you went in the military, then uh, you were disassociated. For sure. But not in Mexico. You have your military card and carry it around. You even bribe the officials to get it, and it's okay down there. For what reason? I can't understand why they don't demand the same of them as they demand of us or they demand of those four people in Malawi. Well, I think if we knew this whole effects had to do with I, I can't help but think that you've got a lot of sour grapes from great friends or somewhere. Well, if it didn't, like I told you, I started out to strengthen myself spiritually within the realm of the Watchtower. And getting a hold of Ray Franz, for instance, was well, way down the road from there. Of course, by then, my loyalties, of course, were uh, were waning by the time I got in touch with Ray Franz, because originally I was in touch with the Pope. But it turns out, even the things we understand about Ray Franz aren't true. And I checked that out by different, uh, I call people in Canada, one in Ireland, one in Alabama to check it out, to see if it was true or not. And it's just the things we've been reported about the man who's aren't true. All we've met is hearsay. Is all that's what we're <clears throat> but it's uh, in a matter like that, a judicial matter, those who are handling the case, uh, the brothers on the committee, that know the circumstances, know the situations, and made the decision accordingly, um, to keep that confidential. That's one of the problems. Publish it. That's one of the problems. The guy who's in fellowship can say anything he wants to anybody. Well, the man who was involved with it, of course, he's got his word too, but that's part of the problem with this fellowshipping arrangement. 
in the days of, of the Christians, it was a public thing. So if we were having this meeting here. The congregation, anyone in the congregation wanted to be a public, to be here to, to publicize it or to witness that they would be here. And this, you know, the Council of Matthew 18 indicates that it should be before the congregation. And that's the way it was in the nation of Israel. So there was nothing to cover up there. The congregation knew about it. So, of course, now they don't allow that sort of thing. They don't allow a public record of it. They don't allow the witnesses. But, I mean, that's... that's that, that, that that is for that book, I wish. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly Still not right. obeying God's laws in this principle. Well, you wish that we could dissuade you and the signature very well set from that and uh, the way you're thinking now. And uh, you've got all the right that we have to pursue what you think is right. As far as organization goes, but, uh, would you mind waiting just a few minutes and we'll, so we can talk and we'll go out there and talk about this and come back and talk to you a little bit more. I'd like to say one more thing before you do that. And it'll probably prevent you, solve, save you some trouble. This is a letter to you, actually to the Watchtower Bible and Tracks, to take care of yourselves. Dated June 22, 1984. Gentlemen, eight months ago, Laverne and I discontinued attendance at the meetings of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society to free ourselves from the time and thought control of the society for the express reason that we had determined to make a thorough scholarly investigation of the teachings of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society as they relate to the Bible. This investigation came to include the history of the society as well as their current organizational procedures. Our heartfelt prayer to Jehovah for his guidance and direction in this matter continues to be answered beyond our greatest expectations. He has blessed us with a flood of information that has enabled us to come to the following irrefutable conclusions. One, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is guilty of continued presumptuous prophetic speculation, beginning with its founder and continuing to the present. Without exception, these prophecies have failed to come true. The society in turn has denied responsibility for these false prophecies. Number two, they have tampered with the sacred scriptures and the translation of their New World Translation to conform these with their particular doctrines. To give credence to their version, they have gone so far as to misquote noted Greek scholars such as Dr. Robertson, Manthe, and Dana. They have used a Bible translated by an admitted spiritist to give support to their translation and doctrine after having exposed this translator some six years before the printing of their Bible. Three, they have a pattern of ever-continued doctrinal and policy changes that often make full 360-degree circles. Their new light has gone from being new light to darkness and back to new light many times over. Four, they have a unity that is the result of ignorance on the part of their adherents and forced upon the threat of expulsion from the society as well as their friends and family. This is true even when the society and its representatives are unable to refute the Bible-based arguments of such persons. Five, they have presumptuously interjected themselves into the chain of salvation in violation of Paul's words in 1 Timothy 2.5, where it is clearly stated there is only one mediator between God and men. Six, <clears throat> they enforce the unchristian act of shunning family members who do not agree with the watchtower hierarchy. Seven, they have endeavored to take away from Christians the God-given right to investigate the truth using God's word, the Bible, without the thought-controlling influence of watchtower literature and the right to express their Bible-based opinions freely. Eight, the Watchtower Society is personally responsible for the death and suffering of thousands of individuals because of their inconsistent application of their own doctrines in various parts of the world, as an example, Malawi and Mexico. The same has resulted due to the interference of the society in the health care of its adherents in such areas as transplants and inoculations. It is with these and many other reasons that we do hereby exercise our Christian obligation and legal right to disassociate ourselves from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. By this action, Laverne and I have voluntarily resigned from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and do not recognize the society or its representatives as having authority over us at all. Since we have voluntarily resigned from this organization, we expressly prohibit you from disfellowshipping us or in any way defaming our character before others. If we are disfellowshipped or are slandered in any way, we will take legal action against you. We do not bear any malice against you, but do recognize the position the society has taken in these matters in an effort to hide the false teaching and incredible inconsistencies within their organization, past and present. Rather than be disheartened at the discovery that we have been misled for over 27 years, we are filled with great joy and eager expectation of a continuing, growing personal relationship with our loving Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Signed by Rick L. Townsend and Laverne, and it was witnessed by a notary, notary public and his signature and affidavit along with it. So, this is for you on your file. 
Yeah, you're right. That does save everything. Well, uh, in case like this, uh, all we have to do is make an announcement to the congregation that you have disassociated yourselves. Well, it's, the reason we wanted it this way is because I know, having been in this organization as long as I have, as soon as you announce the disfellowship, the gossip machine goes into work the next day trying to figure out which orgy they attended or what they did here or what they did there. We don't want that. We want everybody to know that we have disassociated ourselves and that's what we're doing. So, if you have something else to say to us, we'll take our leave. Okay. Thank you for coming. And, uh, Thank you. Don't ever hesitate to get in touch with us. And I do emphasize we do have no malice against you or any of Jehovah's Witnesses at all. We, we love them all dearly. I understand that. We just disagree totally with the influence of the Watchtower Bible Tract Society on these people. And that's, that's all we do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. There are a number of points I would like to touch on in response to what you've just heard. First of all, the charge brought against us was by a witness to whom we had spoken to in our very own home. And also the letter that I had written was a letter written to my own family in response to questioning of Laverne and I as to our spiritual situation. Now you'll notice that rather than these elders or the shepherds of the congregation endeavoring to restore their brother and sister, they immediately assumed a judicial posture. There were no efforts made prior to this meeting to, to discuss with us the things that, that we had talked about. There are a couple of things that happened in that discussion that deserve some clarification. First of all, when we were discussing the year 1975, the one gentleman kept saying, well, they never said the end of the world was coming in 1975. And that's very typical. Any discussion you get into with Jehovah's Witnesses about 1975, surely they're going to tell you that. But it's interesting, as I pointed out to him that I had the proofs, I handed him my notebook, which was open to that chapter on 1975, and has numerous pages of photocopies of what the Watchtower actually did say in their literature. But after he read that first page, he refused to turn the page again. He would not look any further. Of course, he could see himself. There were, there were many, many pages there, and he was afraid to turn to those pages, which is quite typical, actually. I also made mention when we were talking about 1975 about a witness talking to the body of elders in Lompoc. Well, that individual is a circuit overseer, and the point that he was making to that body of elders and to all that body of elders in that circuit was that they should not go around telling the brothers when they were complaining about 1975 that the Watchtower never said it. And he did basically the same thing that I was endeavoring to do, was to show the elders at that time that the Watchtower did clearly indicate that the end of the world was going to come in 1975. And he was counseling those brothers against telling other people that they didn't say such a thing. So it's, it's absolutely absurd when Jehovah's Witnesses tell us they never said the end of the world was coming in 1975. I actually made a mistake there with that notebook and not keeping it myself. Had I kept it myself and read those things to him, perhaps I could have said a little bit more. But since he had control of the notebook, he refused to turn the pages to prove uh, against what he thought that the Watchtower did actually say and indicate very clearly that the end of the world would come in 1975. There were some typical lines of reasoning that were pursued with regards to organization. Jehovah's Witnesses are continually brainwashed into believing that God requires an earthly organization. You can hardly read a piece of their literature that does not emphasize this idea. And yet, they can turn to no clear references to an earthly organization in the Christian Greek scriptures. Inevitably, they're going to refer to Israel, totally ignoring the fundamental truth that we are no longer under the Old Covenant. Paul, in his letter to the Hebrews, went into some length contrasting the old earthly law covenant with the new heavenly covenant. But Jehovah's Witnesses would have us serve under a, a covenant similar to that, having earthly representatives and a whole host of rules and regulations to live by. And in so doing, they're actually declaring insufficient the new covenant. Another point that rarely fails to be presented is that they feel that only Jehovah's Witnesses through a structured organization can fulfill the prophecy of the preaching of the good news earthwide. And in so doing, they fail to acknowledge two things. First of all, that there are countless groups of people serving earthwide in spreading the gospel. And they're using means far more sophisticated than just going from door to door. Even the angel of Revelation 14.6 that Jehovah's Witnesses make reference to many times thought it better to be in mid-heaven declaring the good news rather than walking from door to door. 
Now, some might wonder if this was a typical elders meeting or hearing. After being a wit uh, elder for over 11 years, I can attest to the fact that this was quite typical. Uh, these men are typical elders, and unfortunately it's typical also in as much that there's no deep discussion of Scripture taking place. They just don't have the depth perception. They, they don't get involved in scriptural discussions to a deep level, which is certainly attesting to the, to the shallowness of their arguments with regards to organization and things of this sort. Laverne and I truly hope that this taping will be of benefit to you. And so it's out of love for witnesses and ex-witnesses alike that we've shared this with you, and we certainly do pray God's blessing on all. Thank you very much.